Good morning. Let's all stand together and let's sing.
to see you. If you're visiting with us here today, thank you for coming and, and being a part of our service and worshiping the one true God. The same power lives in us. Amen. If you are visiting with us and haven't filled out a, a connection card, there's some in the pew in front of you. Just fill one of those out and at the end of the service, there's some boxes in the hallways and we'd love to get to know you a little bit better and, and pray along with you if you have a need. There's a place to jot something down on the back if you'd like the staff to, to help you pray through whatever that situation you might be going through. But we're glad you're here. We hope you've come for no other reason than to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? So we're going to receive our offering this morning. Our ushers are going to come, and um, we're going to give back to God what he's blessed us with. And uh, so let's pray together. Ushers, you come. Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together as your church, as this body of believers, to, to worship and to praise you and to, and to say, Lord, we just pray that you're pleased with all of our efforts today. Lord, just be with us through this service and let all that we say and do and sing point someone to Jesus. Father, we just thank, pray that you'll take this offering and, and you'll use it in such a mighty way, Father, that, that there are souls won for your kingdom. Just be with us the rest of this time, and we thank you for all you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing. <laughs> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. this morning.
in God's house. Look at somebody and tell them that you love them and say it like you mean it this morning. Anybody get left out? If you did, George Robinson will come around and give you a hug personally, right? All right. Hey, it's good to be in God's house this morning. It's good to see you. You know, it is a beautiful, beautiful weekend that we've had. I just want to share with you before we get started this morning, we had our, uh, our, our well, I guess you'd say first annual canoe kayak drag yesterday on Pea River. We drug it a lot, and I think Kelly learned the most out of all of this. That is, when you get in the front of a canoe with Jim, Jim had this big old hat on, and I told him, I said, you know, you look just like Catherine Hepburn sitting in the back of that in the African Queen, you know the movie? And so what Kelly didn't know is that Jim never really paddled. She was in front, just steady going, but we had a, we had a really good time. It, it was. If you missed it, we'll do it again sometime. And, uh, but it's, it's just so good to be here. Music was awesome this morning. Can you sing praises loud enough to be worthy of our Savior? Amen. You just got to sing loud. You don't have to sing good. You just have to sing loud, right? And so there you go, Chris. Would you like to give a word of testimony? Is that why you're up? All right. Hey, if you would join me in Matthew chapter 14. This is a big weekend for a lot of folks, uh, we have some amazing young people in this church. Matter of fact, I think all of them are rather amazing. What about you? And uh, some of them have recently become part of some sorority organizations on campus that some of y'all are attached to. But I just want to say this. Any organization or group of people that our young people would attach themselves to are going to be infinitely blessed because we got great young people. Okay. And also, we've got one that's leaving us to go to a far country. Anna, would you just stand up? Going to Mississippi. Yes, you can sit back down because you're embarrassed. I know. It's the last Sunday I had to embarrass you. And I know Fran's so excited. We've, we've gotten some, uh, well, let's just say we've got some products to help her get past you leaving for a while. So be praying for Anna. Pray for all our young people. It is a busy time of year as we come back into the fall. Uh, so if you're with me this morning and you're in chapter 14 of Matthew, just say, I'm there. I'm there. All right, Father God, we praise you and we thank you. Lord, you are holy and you are awesome, and we come to give you praise. And Lord, the music that we sing, it, it, it's not about entertaining us. It is about all praise to you. So I thank you for our, our wonderful blessing of singing and praising. So Father God, now I pray that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, and let us see in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. This is a story that's very familiar to you. It says, Immediately he made the disciples, that being Jesus, get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Oh, everybody just say, But... But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against it. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out with fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, this is the part I love. I, I love this because this is so like Peter. He, he answered him. He said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got up out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, oh, boy, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt and when they got into the boat the wind ceased and those uh, and those in the boat worshiped him saying truly you are the son of god we've been going over the last uh, several weeks and and by the way uh, last sunday uh, michael preached on the faith of abraham and uh, 
before I forget, I just want to say that last Sunday there was some, some things that happened that, uh, hey, I'm just glad to see Gene Manning still in church with us this morning. Aren't you, Gene? He had to be life flighted to Montgomery and have a stamp put in. That's where I left to go last Sunday. And he looks like a brand new man. And those, those people in Montgomery are so glad to get rid of him because he was a pain till they let him come home. So Gene, it's so good to see you. But when we talk about faith for the last several weeks, we started off with the faith of a Gentile and, and how, what, how much it was for the Gentiles to see the supremacy and the authority in Jesus. And, and then we talked about the, the faith of a blind man and, and how if we have just the faith of a blind man, then we will truly see because we will just cast that stuff off that, that really holds us back. It's those beggar's rags. And then Michael last week talked about the faith of Abraham and how God used that one person's life to shape a, a whole people. This morning, we're going to talk about the, the get-out-of-the-boat kind of faith. Hey, how many of y'all have the get-out-of-the-boat kind of faith? Anybody in here? Hey, how many of you would love to have the get-out-of-the-boat kind of faith? You know what I'm saying? Hey, that's the kind of faith we all need is the get-out-of-boat kind of faith. But before we get into the passage, we've got to kind of look and see what led up to it, what brought us, what built up to this step of faith that Peter had. Well, if you look back just in that chapter you'll find out that most recently they were coming off the only miracle, write this down in your notes, the only miracle that occurs in all the Gospels was the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, George and I have this love for all things that bring us to a, a fuller understanding of Jesus. I think when the Old Testament teaches about the feast and the festivals, all the prophecy, I think what you really get there is a true and genuine appreciation of who Jesus really is. I don't think you can really appreciate who Jesus is without spending a little time, George, going everything that God put in the life of the nation of Israel was to help them understand. And you know what? We need some understanding today, don't we? Somebody just say amen. We need to understand that, that Jesus was not just shown up on the scene when he did. Jesus was always there. He was always God and he was always holy. So the feeding of the 5,000 was, was a particularly important miracle performed by Jesus. For the Jewish people, this was the one like Moses. Now, you don't have to turn to this, but just write this down. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses said to the people, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you and a, from among your brothers. And it is him that you will listen to. This Jesus that will come, Messiah, is the one you are to listen to. And I put in my notes, Lord, if they had only listened, we wouldn't have to be sitting here today. We'd be in a heavenly choir by now. But they didn't listen. The one like Moses... To them, they understood clearly was the one who was able to call down the blessings from heaven. He was the one that was able to manufacture manna. Y'all do remember the story of the children of Israel in the desert as they wandered around for 40 years? You know, that was really only about an 11-day walk, and it took them 40 years. And you know what they did for 40 years? Somebody just say, complain. So we know that they had to be what, really? They had to be Baptists. You know what I'm saying? For 40 years, they complained. It's too hot. It's too cold. Why don't we go back and let us have grave space? At least we had food in Egypt. But, but like Moses, Moses was the one who was able to feed them from nothing. He just opened the storehouse of heaven and manna fell, and it was enough for today, and they had to step out on faith for the next day and the day after. Oh, you see, the Word of God is always true. Like me, Moses, the Messiah will come, and he will be from among you and your brothers. Now, I want you to write this down if you haven't already gotten this in your mind. Jesus was born of a virgin. Amen? Now, I can't explain it, and I'm not even going to try, but let me tell you something. I believe that the account that the Bible gives of a holy God bringing forth a child from the Virgin Mary is exactly what happened. How about you? I don't apologize for that. There's a lot of things I can't explain. I mean, one of the things I know, though, is that my God goes beyond my understanding. How about you? 
I also want you to understand that the carpenter's son that they saw and the son of Mary was that part where he was coming from among them. This was a holy Jesus. But the problem is, is that they stumbled over the very things that should have helped them understand. They, they tripped all over it. They, they expected and they should have received the wonderful blessing of the Messiah. The problem is, is they can only see the carpenter's son. Isn't that a shame? Now, now, before we get too hard on the nation of Israel, let me just say something now. Are you ready, church? Sometimes we even, though we sing mighty high and lofty praises to Jesus when we sing, or maybe our prayer life, we use some mighty high and lofty language, sometimes we only see him as a son, a holy God, a Messiah, a Redeemer that worships. The only time we worship him is right here. We kind of put him in this little box. And let me tell you something. My Lord is beyond this little sanctuary. You know what I'm saying? And so we get on the nation of Israel because they should have seen and didn't. But you know how much does the church should have seen and didn't? My Jesus is worthy of worship every single day. How about you? Every day. Oh, this is only the carpenter's son. He's Mary's son. How can this possibly be the Messiah? But now they've got a problem because, Tim, now they stand there and look on the hillside. And just exactly like the prophecy said it would be, he was the one that could bring down manna and feed 5,000. And you know why there were leftovers, don't you? How many baskets of leftovers were there? Somebody say it. It's 12. You know why there was 12 baskets of leftovers? Because there was a bunch of Baptists there that said, I don't want to eat fish. I don't want fish. I want chicken. <laughs> you can insert that in there somewhere. I promise that was part of their thinking. You got me, Josh. You know what I'm saying. So coming off this wonderful, this wonderful high mountaintop experience where you watch 5,000 people, that's not counting women and children. That's just the men as they sit there. You just see Blessing after blessing. Kent, wouldn't you love to have seen it as the basket didn't get bigger, but the food kept coming? They should, have, they should have just had this pulsation in their heart that said, that's him. That's the one like Moses. Jesus said of himself, he said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So for all those that think Jesus is just something we do on Sunday, Fooey on you. For all those that just said he was a carpenter's son, fooey on you. Let me tell you something. He is the only way, and there's not multiple ways. There's only one way to come to the Father, and that's through who? That's through Jesus. He is the way. Oh, so coming off this great, wonderful high of feeding the, the 5,000, we find the apostles in the middle of a sea being tossed by the waves. This is the most, one of the most human stories in the whole New Testament, and I love it because I'm a human. How about you? Sometimes I'm a good human, and sometimes I'm not. How about you? Sometimes I'm a pretty steady-as-the-rock kind of human, George, but sometimes I'm not. How about you? Here they are, being beaten by the wind in the middle of the sea. Isn't that the way it always seems? If you're taking notes, just write this down on the... On the other side of every mountain is going to be a downhill slope, amen? And no matter how high the mountain is, at some point in your life, you're going to go down into the valley. This last couple of weeks, we've all been in the valley as a community, haven't we? We've had so much tragedy, but let me tell you something. That's for a moment. Our praise is forever. Every mountaintop leads over the other side. About the time you think that you have figured it out, you realize that you what? You don't. Have you ever had a time in your life where you thought you had it all figured out? I did. I was 24. I remember it vividly. I was 24 and I had life completely figured out. And then we got married that January. It didn't take me long to figure out, Jenna. Brandon, turn your head just for a second. How, how long did it take him to figure it out? You don't know what I'm saying. You think you got things figured out and all of a sudden you don't? 
you're, you're kind of you're there starting to feel pretty certain about things right up to the point where er- uncertainty creeps in. Have you ever just been totally sure about something only to find out that what you were so sure of wasn't exactly something you could be so sure of? When I was a young person, I used to look at all the people in the government and think they were all, all honorable and noble and they were smarter than me. I was certain of that right up until I figured out that they weren't. About the time you start to feel pretty good about yourself, Satan paints a picture of you that's ugly. This is a dangerous thing, too, so you need to write this down. Satan will lie to you, and he will lie to you, and he will lie to you. And guess what else he's going to do? He's going to lie to you. And Satan will paint an ugly picture of you. I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not worth anything. I don't have anything to contribute. He'll, he'll keep painting that picture. And, and like I always tell our young people, listen, God didn't make any junk. So you be the person that God made you to be, and don't worry about what the world says you're supposed to be. All our young men in this church, I don't care if you grow up to look like me or not. That'd be a blessing. But what I want you to be is a godly man that walks like a godly man, that smells like a godly man, and talks like a godly man. I want you to be a godly man. And not what the world says you're supposed to be. About the time you feel good about yourself, Satan paints this ugly picture of you for you. And the boat just gets tossed. The winds just keep coming and beating against your life. And it's an awful thing because sometimes your mind will, it'll get hard to control your mind. Have you ever lost control of your mind? I mean, I have. I've, I've lost my car keys. I've lost my truck. I lost a letter last week right here Wednesday night. I looked all over this church looking for the letter. Chris had put it on this music stand. Tyler had put his book on it. And I thought, I have lost my mind. How many places could I have possibly gone in about 45 minutes? A lot. So sometimes we just lose our mind. How many of y'all have ever raged teenagers? Do they lose their mind? Well, yeah, absolutely they do. If you put most of them minds on a hummingbird, guess what it would do? It, it would fly backwards, right? It just would. But they're no different from their parents, right? That's the good news. You see, sometimes when the sea is rough and we get tossed around, if we're not careful, we lose control of our mind and fear starts to creep in. The lie starts to take hold. And it comes to everybody. Sometimes fear just dominates, doesn't it? And you've got to watch yourself because you can't live your life by fear. So even after seeing Jesus perform the wonderful miracle of feeding the 5,000, now we find the disciples who have not only seen Jesus feeding the 5,000, but they see Jesus walking on the water. And they're still muddled in their thinking because they are filled with fear. Hard to believe that, isn't it? I mean, I believe Kent, knowing what I know now, if I'd have seen Jesus feeding the 5,000 earlier in that chapter, I'd have been the guy standing up on the hillside beside him going, that's the guy. That's him. Hey, look, turn with me to Deuteronomy. I'm telling you, this is the guy. But I really believe if I'd seen Jesus walking on the water, I'd have went, wow. I I wouldn't even have asked. I'd have just jumped on out and went to him. You know what I'm saying? In my mind, I believe those things. So what happened? Jesus spent a lot of time telling them not to fear. Why? Because they spent a lot of time being afraid. You know what? We we have to be told quite often not to fear. You know why? Because we spend a lot of time being afraid. Fran's not the only one that's daughter's going to Mississippi. We just moved my youngest daughter to Mississippi. Her husband got a job transfer. We moved him. I didn't mind moving him, but I really didn't want to have to leave her. (laughs) 
And you know, for just a few seconds there, it's that where I can't put my hands on my baby. You know? I just can't put my hands on them. And then I had to stop that foolishness. Because you can't live your life with fear. And for all you families out there that are facing some obstacle in your life, maybe, maybe you're not moving a kid to Mississippi. That's bad. Maybe it's just some struggle you're going through. You can't live your life by fear. When, when these young people start taking their place in life, we just got to be confident that what we have helped put into their lives is going to be sufficient to see them through. You know what I'm saying? Are y'all with me on that? You can't live your life by fear. It's easy to let what you see be dominant over what you believe. As a Christian, what you believe has no connection to what you see. Because most of the, wonder, the most wonderful things that you can possibly imagine are stuff you can't see right now, but you will one day. Sometimes when we're singing, my heart gets so full, I, 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 you know, it's just amazing that what joy the, the Lord can put into your life. You haven't heard, I'm sure you have heard rather, that practice makes perfect. How many of y'all have ever heard that saying? Practice makes perfect? Well, the time to challenge yourself and the time to challenge others is before the battle begins. I sat through um, our men's group that meets in the Annex at 9 o'clock. It's a very appealing group. They've, gone, they've finally gone through the whole Old Testament. Now they're in the New Testament. But I like to go because what they have, well, I'm just confessing, they have biscuits and syrup and sausage. They spend the first 30 minutes. <sighs> they experience a little bit of heaven that first 30 minutes, and they talk about the Word of God the next hour and a half. Let me tell you something. It's great stuff. Because the time to challenge yourself and to challenge others is before the battle begins. Because listen to me. Are you listening? The battle's coming. You may not be in it now, but it's coming. For a soldier, we don't train a week before the fight. We train our whole existence for the fight. Police officers spend their whole life training so that they will, in that very moment, do what they're supposed to do. You see, the time to prepare yourself is before the ship gets tossed. And some of us sitting in this room this morning, our ship is getting beat by the storm and we're looking at the waves and we ought to be drilling down hard on who the person of Jesus is in our life. Y'all following me? The time to practice is before everything goes wrong in your life. You need to learn to live on the Word of God and not live in this world now in preparation for then because it's coming. Has anybody in here ever had financial difficulties? If you had, just raise your hand. Any of you had financial difficulties that lasted for decades? You know what I'm saying? I mean, how many of you have ever been depressed or anxious or, or, or things just seem to be a little muddled and you seem to be a little confused? Have you ever had that moment in your life? Time to spend in the Word of God is now because it's coming. The battle's always coming. So let's get back to the story that we read. Peter catches this rare moment and he pushes past his fear. Peter was not perfect. Matter of fact, Peter was a dude a whole lot like the rest of us dudes in here. Peter had a problem with keeping his mouth shut when he should have kept opening it, and he had a problem. He should have been opening it when he kept it shut. Have y'all ever had that problem? He was just like most of us. But he had this rare moment, and he pushes past his faith, and he says to Jesus, he said, if you will call me, I will come. And Jesus said, come on. Come on. You opened your mouth now, big boy. Step on out. Have you ever said stuff you wish you could take back? Now, I don't know what went through Peter's mind, but I bet you when he stood up and said, if you'll call me, I'll come, the eyes in the back of his head saw those 11 going, mm-mm, mm-mm, I ain't doing that. No. Now, a few things were true then, if you want to write them down, because these are important, they're still true now. They were true then, they're true now. I'm going to say they're going to be true until Jesus calls the church home. 
For every one person who wants to do a little water walk, and there will be 11 others trying to pull him back into the boat. All you young people that are starting college or finishing up high school, you're going to have people around you that will not encourage you in your faith walk. They will try to drag you down. And those are not the people you need to hook your wagon to. Are you all familiar with that term? Don't hitch your wagon to those people because they'll, they'll pull you down and you'll drown in their pity. For every one, there's going to be 11 who will pull you back down. And this is what they're saying to you. Have you lost your mind? We got a young man. We got a couple of young men, about three young men in this church that right now are praying over what God's going to do with them as pastors, as people that he's going to use within the body of the church. And let me tell you something. The minute you start acting on what God has called you to do, you're going to have a whole bunch of people around you go, that's the craziest thing I have ever heard. Are y'all with me? You see, to be a Christian, you're going to go contrary to the culture in this world. That's just the way it's always been. And, and if you think it's for the weak and frail, let me assure you of something. If you're going to stand up and do what Christ called you to, pushing through the fear, you will find that you're going to have to be the strongest person you've met lately. Because it's not easy. There's 11 others back there going, what will people think? Have you ever thought about that? What will people think? I had a person one Sunday came up to me. She said, I really would love to have gone down and, and prayed with some of my friends, but I was just worried about what people might think. I said, don't worry about what people think at all. If God put it on your heart to do, do it. You start trying to figure out what people think. I've been married 34 years. I still don't know what my wife thinks. Y'all know what I'm saying? Who cares what people think? Most people are too worried about themselves to worry about thinking about you anyway. And I love this one. Eleven people will be back there in your life going, what will people say if you do this? They might put something negative on Facebook. Do you really care what people say? I mean, really? There's a whole lot of people in your life, folks, that they'll pull you back into the boat if you'll let them. They'll keep you down. Even after you have taken a few steps, there will still be 11 others who will remind you of why this is still a bad idea. Even after you take a few steps. And I love this one. Even after you've walked on the water for just a few steps and begin to sink, there will be all 11 saying, I told you so. Don't you hate that when people go, I told you so? When I first entered the ministry a long time ago, I had no idea what the ministry was. All I knew was what I was taught in Sunday school, and I knew that I loved Jesus, and I knew I loved the Word of God, and that seemed to be all I needed until I ran into people. You know, church would be a perfect place if it wasn't for people. Here's what's important. Write this down. I'm not here to beat up on Peter for taking his eyes off Jesus because every single one of us in this room have done that from time to time. You'll start looking at stuff that you don't need to be looking at. You'll start questioning things you don't need to question, and all of a sudden you're no longer looking at Jesus. You're looking over here somewhere. I'm not here to beat up on Peter because let me tell you something. Peter did more than 11 others did. I'm not here to throw Peter under the bus for being afraid because we all do that. I've been afraid. How about you? I'm not here to tell you that for every one of you who has that get-out-of-the-boat kind of faith, that, that if you take those rare steps that it's always going to work out perfect because it's not always going to work out perfect. But no matter how bad it was for Peter as he stepped out of that boat, no matter if he didn't take but five steps or ten steps. Let me tell you what I love about Peter. Peter did something that 11 other people will never know what it was like. And Erica, that's what I'm praying for this church. 
I don't expect you to have it perfect. I don't expect you not to fail. But what I expect you to do is get out of the boat and experience something that the people around you will never know. That's what faith is, isn't it? Eleven other people never knew what it was to walk on the water. They had that one chance. They could, have, they could have stood up with Peter and said, hey, just call the whole group, Lord. Let's have a revival meeting out there. And they blew it. And in our churches today, we're filled with people who get right to the edge. They get right to the edge. They're so close. And, and being able to say, Lord, I, I don't care what the people behind me are saying. I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about what they might say, but I'm going to step out on my faith and I'm going to do something because you call me to it. That's what's important. Oh, I love it. Most people will be content to stay in a stormy and a wind-tossed boat. That's the way we live our lives in our culture today, guys. We'd rather stay in the boat that's getting beaten by the winds than put our faith into Jesus and just walk where he is. I pity those 11 but I'm so thankful for that one, aren't you? So what if you sink a little? You know what? I've learned that everything coming out right every time is not always that painful. How about you? Do you know people don't agree with everything I say? Can you all believe that? People don't always like the way I do stuff. Can you believe that? But I have a choice. Carolyn, I can either step out and do what I'm supposed to do or I can sit in the boat with everybody else. So this, I'm, getting, I'm getting to the end. I just want you to write this down, if you will. Leaders don't sit in the back of the boat. Amen? And some of you know you are leaders and you're just afraid to step out and do what you're supposed to do. But there is no victory in concession. It's time the people of God Take a few steps on faith and not by what they see. Amen? Father God, we praise you. And I pray over every person here, Lord. Every person here has something in their life that they have to deal with. And every person in their, this room has a, other people in their life that they have to deal with them. But Lord, I pray that we would let our faith push us past the fear and step out and, and just enjoy a step or two. We know you're there. If we sink, you're there. If we walk, you're there. But Lord, please don't let us be so minded to stay in the boat and never experience freedom and joy and victory. Lord, I pray over these young people that are going through some major changes in their life this year. I pray that you protect their bodies, but also their minds and their hearts and their spirits. Lord, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.